I think this is our, our 10th annual Artist of the Year celebration. Um, I'd like to identify the other members of the Santa Cruz County Arts Commission who, are, who may be here with us this evening. Um, I represent the first district. Betty Allen from the second district, if you're here, fellow commissioners, would you please stand or raise your hand? There's Betty back there. Um, Reynaldo Barrios from the third district, Diana Hendrickson from the fourth district, and Mary Kay Hubbard from the fifth district. Um, we're really delighted that at this year's Artist of the Year celebration, we can welcome former recipients of our Artist of the Year, and um, those um, wonderful members of our community include Tandy Beal, Lou Harrison, Jim Houston, who's down here in front. Jim, would you stand? <laughs> the Cabrillo Guild of Music. Um, I believe C Celia Hartman is the pr current president. Uh, George Barati. Charles Hilger received an um, award in visual arts. Charles is here. The Cultural, San Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County, Felix Robley is president. William Everson, the poet, who's joined us here this evening. And last year's recipient, Doug McClellan. Doug? I'd like to take a minute to explain to you how our Artist of the Year is chosen. Um, our Artist of the Year are chosen for their outstanding achievement in various disciplines, the performing, visual, and literary arts. They must be a resident of Santa Cruz County. Their work must have a national, and in fact, all of our artists have had international reputations. They must have contributed to the enrichment of the local arts community, and we're very pleased that the artists in our community have really become members of our community and are participating as volunteers and um, are working side by side with so many of us in a lot of different ways. They must also have presented or assisted in presenting their art here in Santa Cruz County. As a commission, we believe that the arts are very special in Santa Cruz County. They're, it shows up in so many ways. I don't know how many of you are aware of our Art in Public Places program, but as you travel around the county over the next few months, I hope you'll take an opportunity to go into some of our parks. You'll see in the Barmer Street Park, for example, a wonderful piece by an artist that was done with some school children of tile work on a wall, as well as a fountain that was designed by an artist. There's also new pieces going in at um, 7th Avenue. There's a new park there. There's an artist that's been working on an installation. There's also out in Willowbrook, a new park there. And we'll be dedicating both the Willowbrook Park and the 7th Avenue Park in the months ahead. I hope when those um, dedications occur, or in the meantime, that you'll go and stop by and see how artists in our community's work is coming to, up to show in, in public art. We also feel very committed to arts and education, and we're very proud of the SPECTRA program that the Cultural Council does. And we're looking forward to working to identify new ways for arts and education to be strengthened. We also believe that building bridges through art is very important in our community, not only in terms of recognizing the multiculturalism that our community has developed and recognizing that multiculturalism, but also in building bridges to other communities. I'll give you a couple of examples of some projects we're very pleased to have helped seed. At Juvenile Hall, we've had an artist working with young people who have been incarcerated in creating a mural showing them that there's ways to find self-expression other than um, through the means that they've chosen in the past. We also have a mural on the freeway if you're coming along traveling south towards Soquel Avenue exit near, um, near Dominican Hospital, you'll see a mural along the side. An artist worked with a, the community of um, disadvantaged um, kids in that neighborhood, bringing them together 
they had been um, conflicted with each other and were, there was potential for gangs there and those kids came together and found a new way to communicate with each other. And as you travel along Front Street towards the beach, you'll see on the left hand side a residential mental health center that's been painted on the exterior by an artist. The whole exterior has been um, designed as a mural. I'd like to um, now take the opportunity to introduce to you Ray Belgard, who's our fourth district supervisor, who'll be serving in the next phase. And also to recognize, I think we have a couple of other supervisors here with us tonight, Gary Patton and Walt Simons. So welcome to all of you, and we hope that you enjoy the evening. Ray. Thank you uh, very kindly, uh, Barbara, for inviting me here. And uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be here in such a fine surroundings, although uh, a bit small, it would seem. Um, but I think the county has long shown its uh, support of the arts. And I think that goes back to uh, days when Ted Durkee, who was sitting here tonight, was the CAO. And uh, we've, we've tried to do uh, little bits of things, but I think that uh, part of the county support in getting the financing and the money for this place, it speaks for itself, I, I believe. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And I was trying to think of things to say uh, that would make it sound really good, like I wasn't preaching to the uh, choir. But uh, what I could say about art is, you know, you already know. So uh, uh, it's, a, its message uh, is loud and clear. It uh, comes in the form of ties. Uh, it comes in the, the form of drawings and paintings and uh, uh, looks and all sort of things. So uh, I don't want to waste a lot of time. I want to get down to the uh, nitty gritty of things. I, I usually try to uh, get to the basis. And I brought a proclamation here to present to Jack on behalf of the uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, and I saw Jack in the back of the room somewhere a little while ago, but he disappeared down one of those halls. Did he uh, reappear? Oh, why did, come, why did you come on up and join us, Jack? We got, we got two or three things we probably want to show you. Now you stand like this, like Jack Benny would sort of do, and I'll, I'll kind of, okay. I'll, I'll sort of read this thing to you a little okay. bit if I can read. If I uh, disapprove, I'm close enough to do so. All right, that, no, that's good. Now, uh, this is a proclamation uh, from the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors uh, honoring Jack, hey Jack, as a 1993 Artist of the Year, and I think uh, quite an honor and uh, well deserved. Uh, it says. Whereas Jack Sajak's work, including both paintings and sculpture in metal and stone, has been widely acquired and shown by museums of fine art in public places across the United States, in Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Yugoslavia, Israel, and also over at the County Government Center, where a lot of people get to see some of it, <laughs> including myself. Um, and whereas Jack has uh, contributed to the enrichment of the community of Santa Cruz County by inspiring and encouraging young art students through his tenure at the University of California at Santa Cruz, which began in 1969. And whereas in 1990, Jack Zajac was nominated to the National Academy of Design, America's highest award for the artist, and received the Pre de Rome 1954-57, and whereas Jack Zajac also served the community as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Art Museum of Santa Cruz County, as well as several public art and panels and co committees. And whereas Jack Sajak is probably the only sculpture in the world courageous enough to tackle water as a subject for his work. So courage is here. He, yeah. He's like a lion, right? Uh, whereas this, this community has graced with pieces of Jack Zajac's sculpture, which will be appreciated for generations to come. Now, therefore, I, Ray Belgar, Chairman of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, do hereby proclaim Jack Sajak as Santa Cruz County's 1993 Artist of the Year and honor him for his significant 
contributions to the arts and to Santa Cruz County community. Jack, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll see that it'll be overshadowed a little bit by. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it'll be uh, overshadowed a little bit in uh, size and shape by the Senate and the Assembly people, but uh, this is homegrown, so you know, consider it. Thank you very much. That's, that's, a, right. that's wonderful to have it. Right. Thank you. Next. Well, I think you can stay here because now it's my pleasure to introduce Claudine Wildman, who's here representing State Senator Henry Mello. Claudine? Thank you, Barbara. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to represent Senator Mello. Unfortunately, he's unable to be here. He's at another speaking engagement in the district. I think uh, certainly the crowd here tonight is a testimony to this community's acknowledgement of Jack's achievement in the arts. And on behalf of Senator Mello, I would like to present him with the Senate resolution. Okay, one more. You know, I forgot to say, I, I don't know, I'm sure all of you have been in this building before, but I think this is also a doubly rich celebration. We're celebrating the new home of the Santa Cruz Art Museum, and uh, the space is wonderful, and we're delighted to um, have Jack's show here in conjunction with our Artist of the Year. Um, I'd like to ask Sally Johnson now to come up on behalf of Assemblyman Sam Farr. Sally? Hi, Sam is sorry he couldn't be here either, um, but he's given me a few words to say, not to read the, the proclamation, but to say, as we all know, Jack Zajac is versatile, accomplished, and provides us with a model of self-determination. I've been asked to add that it's in consideration that he started with a bingo parlor sometime earlier in his life. <laughs> Beyond his work, can be seen his deep interest in his community through students, museum goers, county fair participants, and still beyond, he's taken us to a timeless flow that he's studied and is letting us in on. Thank you. This is almost overwhelming. And um, Paige Smith, if you would please join me, because there is more words to describe Jack Zajac than I possibly have in my vocabulary. So we've asked Paige, who is UCSC Professor Emeritus, uh, to introduce Jack, who I know is his friend as well as all of our friend. Paige, would you? It <laughs> seems to me Jack's been pretty well introduced already, <laughs> but uh, I'm certainly pleased and honored to be asked to say uh, another few words. Uh, if I were an art critic, I might feel obliged to undertake to review uh, briefly Jack's various uh, phases, uh, phases of his work, but I'm sure he'll do that better than, than I could. And, uh, so I'll uh, talk or speak very briefly about his, uh, his, biography, his biography or about those, those, that aspect of it that uh, uh, I am familiar with. Uh, Jack was born in Youngstown, Ohio in 1929. There are some facts here that I was uncertain about when I sat down to, to contemplate the nature of this uh, event and my role in it. And I didn't uh, feel I could call Jack because I was told he was too nervous to answer the telephone. So uh, I thought, well, he's going to be here tonight. So wherever I come to some space where I'm not quite sure, I can simply ask Jack. Uh, he came to Southern California in, uh, when was that, Jack? 1946. 19, 
1946. I think, I think it's right that not just mythology, that he worked in a steel mill. He'd already learned how to play the violin. And then he was admitted as a special student. I don't mean to imply that there was a direct connection between the violin playing and his being admitted as a special student. But he was admitted as a special student to Scripps College for Women in Claremont, uh, California. Isn't that right? I've always been a lucky <laughs> And there, I think I'm right on this, and I keep referring to Jack, he met Corda Eby, an excellent artist in her own right, and uh, that was at the beginning, at, at, I don't know the precise date of their lifelong alliance, but in 1954, Jack won, as has been mentioned, the Prix de Rome. He went to Rome, he won it as a, for his uh, painting, painterly abilities, and uh, he went to Rome, and there he, uh, began to, or I don't know quite, maybe Jack will tell the exact circumstances, but he began messing around with a piece of clay, which turned into a, a lamb or a goat, and he realized that was really his calling, and that was the thing that, that drew him. Uh, his standing lamb, circa 1954, was one of his first, or his first a piece and announced him, as one might say, as an instant sculptor. I think when one looks at the piece, it is amazing to think that it was the first? The first. The first. <laughs> That's so helpful. To <laughs> uh, but I just think it is really remarkable. And I would be surprised if any sculptor, uh, if we searched through the annals, would uh, we could find one who had done a piece that so instantly announced him as a, a person, an artist, a sculptor of power and, and significance. Uh, it has about it an astonishing assurance and maturity. Uh, Jack's love affair with Italy began then, and uh, he and Corda have a home in Umbria and have divided their time between Umbria, between Italy and, and Santa Cruz for many years. Um, I have told elsewhere and often, probably to the point of tedium, uh, how it came about that Eloise and I came to Santa Cruz. When I was asked by Dean McHenry to come here to, to uh, be the so-called provost of the first college, I had misgivings of one kind and another, but Eloise said, if you go, maybe you can get Jack and Corda Zajac to come to Santa Cruz. We, uh, while I was ostensibly making up my mind, we went to Italy, and Eloise spent most of the time in Rome trying to track down uh, Jack and Corda. She didn't succeed, but she never uh, wearied or slackened in her efforts to, to persuade uh, Jack and Corda to come. Uh, Jack came, they came first uh, on a visiting basis, I think, in... 1969, and uh, five years later? Three. Three years later. Three years later, uh, for good. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's how I got to Santa Cruz. I came in order to try, at my wife's instance, to persuade Jack and Cor to come, and it took a little while, but uh, here they are. Um, I think in the strange, to me, strange desert of contemporary art, there's so much, where there is so much plain ugliness, so much faddishness and pretentiousness, so much playing of the art game, the life and work of Jack Zajac stands out with particular power and presence. I believe that all great work has to connect itself to the best in the past, to speak to the time and yet to transcend it and connect with all time. At the threshold of this century, the critic John J. Chapman wrote that we needed to feed upon the great works of the past. Songs, aspirations, stories, prayers, reverence for humanity, knowledge of God, or else some dreadful barrenness will set in. To cut loose, to cast away, to destroy, seems to be our impulse. We do not want the past. This awful loss of all the terms of thought this beggary of intellect, Chapman concluded. Whenever I think of Chapman's words, which I 
often do, I'm inclined to think of Jack's work and of the sense that it conveys of working within a great tradition. We live in an age which seems to want to overturn or deny everything noble in our heritage. There seems to be a strange rage of modernity in the land. Jack's work stands to me four square against such destructiveness. What seems to me most compelling about his work is the treatment, his treatment of the classic themes of suffering, death, sacrifice, redemption. His work speaks of power and passion and courage. Those are the words that come most readily to mind when I look at and think about his work. And I think maybe courage most of all. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, Harold Urey, the physicist, nuclear physicist, spoke at the campus. And after his talk, a student asked him what he thought the most important uh, quality of a scientist was. And I think people expected Urey to say thoroughness or objectivity or, or discipline or whatever. And he said courage. And then he went on to explain that, that uh, a, a physicist or oh, a generation, a decade or two prior to Yuri's uh, career, had come upon uh, the formula for uh, heavy water, which was what Yuri got the Nobel Prize for. And uh, uh, he, it was against all the accepted notions of, of, of that time in physics. And he was embarrassed about it. He felt he would just bring upon himself ridicule if he, if he uh, wrote or talked or announced that discovery. So he put it in his desk drawer and tried to forget about it. And that left it for Yuri to uh, discover heavy water and to win the Nobel Prize. And it seems to me that that is one of the qualities in Jack's work that I find most compelling, that it is a work of a man of, of passion and of great courage. I think it's reassuring in a time of wild confusion in the whole realm of aesthetics that Jack's sculpture has been recognized as, as, a great, as great and enduring work and that he is represented, as other uh, people have mentioned, in the right museums, in the right places, in the right countries, the Museum of Modern Art, the Hirshhorn, the Metropolitan, the Muse Museum of Modern Art, Proctor Munson Institute, and on and on. The simple list of the honors and distinctions that he is, has uh, won or been, been awarded to him would take up quite a lot of time. For the work on, uh, on exhibition here in the gallery uh, and in connection with the dual honors that are being conferred on him tonight by, by the university as the guest lecturer and by the county, um, I'm glad to borrow from the review of Kenneth Baker, art critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, in reviewing a wonderful retrospective show of Jack's work three years ago at the Oakland Museum, Baker was charmed by Jack's falling water pieces. He said he wrote, the streamlined standing forms of these pieces are inherently elegant and bring an unexpected range of illusions. They distill to an essence the fundamental paradox of representational sculpture. Fixed form standing for the inimitable flow of life. And I think that's a very powerful phrase and that it's characteristic of all Jack's work, that in it one senses the inimitable flow of life. Water, of course, brings me, the mention of water brings me to streams and rivers. Whenever I speak of Jack's work, wherever I uh, start, I always come at last to, to trout. <laughs> My most vivid picture of Jack is waist deep in the Snake River casting a beautiful long line across the current. The late art critic uh, of the San Francisco Chronicle, Alfred Frankenstein, said Stein said, uh, called Jack the Michelangelo of her time, of our time. Uh, I like to think of him as the Isaac Walton of our time. I give you Jack's agent. I'm going to make my, um, my thanks to all of you very short because um, anything longer would be uh, rather too emotional. So <clears throat> thank you, Paige. Uh, I, um, I will uh, thank you now for being responsible for, for having us come to Santa Cruz and, and uh, uh, 
finding all of this, this uh, extraordinary life. Um, it was Paige that first invited us up and, uh, and lured us up with uh, promises of, of um, well, the San Lorenzo River, full of steelhead trout, I think. Uh, he is a man of entire impeccable integrity, but in this case, he was hedging the truth. Uh, there were a few more then than, than there are now, but, uh, but uh, thank you for that white lie, Paige. I, I, uh, uh, this is an honor. I would, uh, I would never have guessed this to happen, and um, I have a fear that possibly I peaked out a little too soon. And I was, the specter may be five years from now being in front of the Octagon Museum saying, Sir, I'm the ex-artist of the year. And these, these are my clippings, and this is my poster. And uh, the only alternative to that would maybe go down the coast with my sort of sculptures and, and Moss Landing or Carmel or something and say, you know, you squint your eyes and you hold them up like this, they, they look a little like a dying clown. Uh, or, uh, but uh, I think I, I ha we're happily doomed to, to spend our days here and, and uh, we'll do so, um, I hope, uh, for a good many more. The, the prospects of speaking uh, about one's work always are, are loaded with perils, and, and uh, one of them is getting ensnarled in, in one's own syntax and saying something truly stupid or incomprehensible. <laughs> in the long tradition of artists saying stupid, incomprehensible things about their work. Uh, for example, uh, there, I, this is a story I've, I've uh, mentioned before. A, a very famous, a, a great artist, uh, who, who I won't mention, uh, his name was William de Kooning, uh, uh, gave us a, a, a drawing to a friend of his years ago, and, um, and his friend threw it away because it wasn't a very good drawing. And he met this friend on the street some months later, and he said, you throw my drawing away. He said, if you were going to throw it away, I would have given you a good one. And. Uh, so, the complexities of, of artistic thought are, are over and over demonstrated. Um, I can enumerate a great many others, just that it's, it's uh, nerve-wracking to try and recollect uh, how the work was done in an honest, uh, in, in an honest pattern and, uh, and to make it uh, seem somehow more interesting than it really was, which is, is uh, what we try to do. Uh, <laughs> because there's a great lot of donkey work and a whole lot of muddle. In fact, when Paige mentioned the fact that this one piece uh, came so easily, I made up for it more than, than enough by the many, many blunders and destroyed work. And, and failures that were carted off and abandoned and so forth. And I'm going to share that with you. There is one, um, one good reason to speak about one's work. Um, and that is, is precisely to make it um, uh, as, uh, as um, sort of unrigid as, as um, art history often sees it. Um, we reread about things, and they seem to kind of uh, develop without flaw and without um, uh, hesitation. I, I will explain that. It also uh, is good for students to know, and I know there are some of them here, and, and uh, to, to share with them the, the fact that um, uh, you can change your mind. You can uh, alter your course. You can, you can fail. You fail in dignity. Um, if not uh, always in, in agreement. So I'm going to start with paintings and, and move through and, and try and make the, the water pieces uh, uh, a point at which the most important thing in my life happened, which was, was a renewal. Uh, that is the, the surrendering of all early skills and, um, and achievements and the, sorry about this, this is a, uh, and the, um, 
the discovery of new means to say this, uh, to work with this new body of work. So I'll, I'll use the first, I'll take the first slide now. And uh, now. <laughs> Oh, it is. My strange story begins as a painter. <laughs> um, this is a painting that goes back to uh, 1951, I think. Uh, and it's fairly representative of, of uh, paintings that were uh, my concern at that time, a reflection of, uh, of both the the observed California landscape and an attempt to assimilate the, the prevailing uh, genre of that time, which was abstract expressionism, which um, had this enticing liberty and energy and, um, and uh, the, the, the gesture of, of the brush was a great part of it. And these paintings were uh, an attempt to s assimilate that which was uh, before me in fact and that which was a trend in the art world at that time. Um, the next few uh, pictures are now. Okay. They were designed to move very subtly. <laughs> Actually, predating kinetic art by almost a decade. <laughs> uh, the, the figure was also a concern. Uh, and uh, the next group of paintings are a very large group of um, 100 or so, which which I worked on uh, for five or six years and never came to any uh, sort of consensus on whether they were good or not. But uh, um, Now these things uh, uh, parallel uh, the iconography in, in a great many religions. A lot of religious fables have this, this um, concept of um, man dying for the redemption of others. It's a, it's a very strong uh, image. And uh, although these don't uh, make no attempt to specifically uh, use those it images, or rather the, the specifics of that uh, fable, they, they parallel them in a general way. Uh, As I got further into this, the figures became more uh, in, in flux. Uh, the paintings were, uh, at times, the same painting might be uh, seen as a, as a deposition, a figure taking one figure down from, from uh, uh, the site of, of uh, the crucifixion, another uh, a sense of uh, resurrection. These things were turned over and over again. They got deeper in a kind of cosmic soup of, of possibility and, and uh, much more difficult to sort of get out of. They, they are very clearly uh, beholden to Goya and the chiaroscuro paintings, Caravaggio, and, and uh, at that time I was trying to work with uh, mainly black and white with some color as a kind of accent, but, but the, the drama was in, in, the, uh, in the organization of light and dark. And that's the lamb. And, uh, aww. <laughs> uh, I know this sounds like an art story, but it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, in, in the midst of this sort of uh, fervor of, of making these big paintings and, and trying to synthesize uh, a, a great many things that were very uh, uh, secure in their own isolated parts, uh, this seemed a great refuge. It was a real sanctuary. I found this clay. Uh, after uh, a 
an excursion. Rome at that time, this was made during the Rome Prize, uh, was surrounded um, very, very closely outside the first wall by pastures. And, and, um, and you would see this wonderful ancient um, um, sort of uh, bucolic scene. Uh, this was a simple sort of labor of love, no, no attempts at any significant statement. But uh, uh, the, the, the Mediterranean uh, has, a, has a, a tradition of taking the kid, the sacrificial animal, uh, as, a, as a feast on, on Easter. And uh, although it is not specifically a sacrifice, it seemed to me a kind of uh, irresistible uh, image of, of the, the object of sacrifice, or the sacrifice, the ritual still continuing, although the religious significance was gone. And I tried to sort of see it again as, as, uh, as, a, as a sacrificial animal in the true sense of the word, a bound goat uh, straining at, the, uh, at its bonds. Uh, if one were to sort of um, think about religious iconography, at that time uh, it seems that everything had been seen so often and so uh, became so hackneyed in, in the kind of emotional sentimentality of, of those images that the goat seemed a fresher way to say something about that uh, without using the, uh, the old image. Uh, the stake, this is called Easter Goat II. And the stake was an introduction, uh, uh, rather an invention of my own, to give the, the goat a, 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 a thing which would threaten its, its fragility. These, these stakes touch the stomach of the animal where all life seems to dwell. A goat's belly is very, very fragile seeming. And uh, uh, the goat also has a, a wonderful architecture. It has a kind of a full hand of, of sculptural uh, form of, of the whole index. It has a bony uh, scaffolding, a, a very soft stomach, the beautiful udder, and, and all the, the, the stages in between. So this, this combination of, of, the, of the steak and the, and the goat stomach was, was the whole sort of uh, point of these. They, they were sort of referred to over and over again as the impaled goat, which made me sort of, sort of very sort of irritated because the, the, the death is not imminent. It's still, um, uh, I mean, the death has not um, happened. It's still imminent. This is a very clear kind of uh, representation of that sort of, um, that stake. It also gives a kind of, uh, strong geometry, a, a way of anchoring the piece and, and uh, referring the, the sort of violent parts of the goat to that rigid uh, uh, diagonal stake. Not having the frame of a canvas around me, I suppose I wanted to sort of find something that uh, would give it this leverage. One doesn't see the the cord, one just uh, sees the sort of uh, contortion of the goat. Uh, this is the first of a, another group called the Metamorphosis. In the process of um, retouching wax in the foundry, one, one uh, usually has a wad of sort of taffy-like wax in one hand and a, and a sort of hot tool in the other. And you, you try and recover some of the freshness of the wax before it goes into the final state of bronze. And, and uh, I began to make small figures with this wad of taffy-like wax until it uh, became a, 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 an avenue in itself. Uh, I began to sort of make shapes very unconsciously and introduce a head or an arm or a figure, which in a sense is a, was both a metamorphic process in, in terms of the making and, and, the, and the image. And this is the most rudimentary of those, and they develop um, 
in a sort of um, ethereal gesture over a, a, quite, a, quite a number uh, of these pieces. You can see the head, the profile of the head to the right, and there's another figure emerging out of the, out of the upper right hand and, and these uh, feet at the bottom. Uh, in time, they got more earthbound, and, and these are called deposition. They're about 12 inches high, and there may be 20 of these uh, existing. Uh, the piece got uh, more uh, to, to feel the weight of the figure that it was carried and, and uh, to, 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 to bow under this, this, this weight. The supporting figure um, uh, is, is defined by these uh, legs. You know, one of the things that sculptors always have to say is uh, the photographs <laughs> don't help see them very well. And this is true because these things are done in the round. So I, I, if you look kind of dazed and, and befuddled, I'll, I'll understand. But take my word for it, they're, they're, they're very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> you can make the figure out on, on the top in this uh, this a little more clearly. And it ended in a, in a, a ten foot piece uh, that was commissioned by Redlands University. It's, it's in, in bronze at that point. Now, <clears throat> uh, one of the things, one of the, one of the dangers of, of, of of working in any art, I suppose, is that you get so comfortable and so uh, secure in one style that you you uh, confine yourselves yourself to that that one image. And even though things come along and sort of invite you to explore them, you you say well, that's fine, I, that's that's a nice sunset, but it isn't what I do. And that's that's a that's a very dangerous thing to do as an artist because. Uh, it seems, if anything can be said of it, that your work cannot stay at a status quo. It either has to move forward or, or, or wilt. And the, the artistic landscape is littered with artists who, who started off with very strong inspired things in their early phases of their life and, and have become a commodity and um, are afraid to, to uh, relinquish that for fear that they will lose their status or sales or whatever. Uh, there a, was a very interesting painter co called Fairfield Porter that said uh, very so clearly, we must always be alert to the possibilities that present themselves and be willing to have the courage to follow those. Um, and uh, even if it seems uh, dangerous or uh, sort of um, unrewarding at first, it, it's, uh, it's good to do that. In the process of working with these metamorphic figures, uh, I began to play with uh, the clay. Uh, someone seeing me do this likened it to the way a child plays with a cow pie sometimes. You squeeze it, and it, this is a farm story. Uh, you city folks, probably. <laughs> but anyhow, one, one, the, the business of play is a very important part of sculpture. For, for one thing, it's extremely boring most of the time, and you have to divert yourself. So I began to squeeze these wads of, of clay and made uh, these small masks that had a ram-like configuration because the, the, the wax oozed out from the two fingers. And I put these things down. I'm a hoarder when I get onto some sort of track I, uh, and insecure. So I make a lot of things and surround myself with these evidences of security and my ability to do things. Most of them end the, up the back in the pot. But, uh, uh, but for that moment, that seemed to be a, 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 a lead to go somewhere. And I began to make these ram skulls in, in, in a bigger uh, scale in, in plaster. But they remained a kind of rigid mask and, and, uh, and not really as successful as the great precedents in African sculpture and so forth. Uh, and 
In the making of these things, one of these horns came apart, and uh, that began a series called uh, Ram Skull with Broken Horn. And another thing should be mentioned here, um, uh, one, the romantic version of being an artist is to get an idea, you know, uh, something uh, vivid, uh, a man being strangled by a money belt, by a man in a top hat, uh, <laughs> things like that. And then you proceed and you do these, these things. The, the, the fabric that, that weaves into the making work art is so dense and, 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 uh, and um, full of uh, chance and avenues that it's very hard to define. But uh, when, when this thing, when this one horn broke off and this thing began to lie on its side, it offered uh, uh, vast possibilities. The, the, the combination of the sweep of one horn uh, the, uh, it now had a beginning and an end, the, the skull being uh, massive and, and, uh, and, and complementary to the horn and so forth. It also uh, allowed uh, a scenario for, for drama, invented, but nevertheless useful for the artist working, uh, where you say uh, this thing either seems to assume the, the look of, of a triumphant uh, 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 you know, a, an image that lived and had power and vitality and is now ravaged and, and uh, altered, but still maintains its dignity. And um, that's the, that is what I felt at that time. It's so hard to define uh, in, in a visual form a word like uh, triumphant or, or, uh, or, or vigor. I can do it, I can do it, I can show you what it feels like. It, it sort of feels like that, you know. But, but uh, that's hard to sort of, sort of put out. I remember walking along with Chris and Aaron once in Wyoming, and uh, walking doing something like, like this. It was trying to define sort of one of these sort of uh, swan in its wake, water passing over a rock. And they were laughing hysterically at me. I didn't know I was doing this, but. That's the way it was. This is this is triumphant. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, in the in the development of these in plaster, the the, the stratification of the plaster uh, uh, was very compatible with the idea of, of of horn and bone and fracturing and sedimentation and so forth. So I'm going to go through these things, and uh, that's one that's uh, in the San Diego Museum. It's a it's a big open skull about four feet long. Uh, this is uh, at the UCLA Sculpture Garden. Uh, you see the horn to the right and the skull pointing upward. And that's, uh, that's at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington. And this, this one, uh, if, when we when, when artists get a little uppity, they, they should really also always go to a foundry and get cut down to size because I call for the mold of this in Rome to, to the foundry. And uh, Ramo said to his, uh, to his uh, worker, Romolo, vai prendere quel prosciutto. And he, they referred to this as the ham. <laughs> and, and, and then he caught himself and, and said, ma professore, scherziamo. You know, we were just kidding. But they weren't. <laughs> Anyhow, anyhow, these are smaller versions of, of those. At a certain part in the working of these, these things came apart, and I would sort of have a, a horn and a piece and try to join it, and, and other times they were left to remain apart. And um, that, is, that is one of the first that, that uh, are in two parts, and the prosciutto looms up there in the background. <laughs> These are quite small. Uh, now, here's the part that, that uh, I want to pause in, and I'll do more talking now than ever again. But it, it, it's important to, since this, <clears throat> the show at the Octagon uh, are of the falling water <clears throat> pieces, um, 
the, the water pieces represent a, a, an interlude that, is, that was very important for me. It, it, um, it, it was a, a, a humiliating, and, or at least a, a process of both exhilaration and the removal of any confidence I had in the earlier work. If you could say that all of the earlier pieces, the metamorphosis, the early goats, these skulls and horns, uh, were expressive. They, they uh, had a working <coughs> method that was uh, one of uh, change and, and a kind of freedom in, in, uh, in where they could go. Um, the, they, they, they all related in a certain way. And we were in Southern California in Ontario in, in I guess, 1961, and I had a, a an industrial building full of, of large skulls. I tried to make these, these earlier pieces in a grander scale and left them to go to New York to do a, a, an errand of some kind. Went to, to Connecticut to see a friend overnight. And uh, it was March, and we were going along the, a river in, in a train, and I noticed the frozen river having all these wonderful mounds and, and uh, sort of... Uh, trails and corrections and and then reflected back on Dutch uh, uh, rivers and so forth and came back to the studio in Ontario and made a small, very small, fairly harmless panel of two currents convening as they sometimes do, one pressing to the other and and um, and uh, reconst re, uh, uh, conforming itself. It's the kind of thing you could write haikus about. Very subtle, very remote, appreciated probably by small, hunched <laughs> Taoist poets <laughs> in China mountaintops. But not, not enough of a kind of uh, statement to sort of, uh, you know, be, be satisfactory. And I tried a number of those, and then tried a, a falling water piece, just the idea seemed to happen. And, and then I tried another one. I thought I would put these away and go back to the skulls. And over a period of two years, I worked every day uh, uh, compulsively, with a few days off, to try and get this falling water thing to work. And, and it, it wasn't going. And the reason it wasn't going is that I had too damn many uh, uh, sort of uh, securities within artistic uh, forms and, and wouldn't, wouldn't sort of let go of them and, and begin to learn anew from, from what, I was, what I was seeing or, or feeling. And it was a process of, re of, 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 of surrender, complete sort of giving away everything I knew and, and learning newer things to, to uh, deal with these water pieces. And at least 40 of these things were made in an eight-foot scale. And, and every time I did one, I thought that was the one. And uh, this was really the one. And it, it, a few weeks later, it was obviously a, a mess. And it went to the landfill at the at Pomona, the Pomona Dump. And finally one good one came about, and uh, then a few more. There were, I guess there were seven of these, and uh, they were all against a pedestal. I, I, I had to sort of explain them by putting them against something that said this is the source. These are, this is a marble. Anyhow, after the, the vertical piece, I, I tried the panel again, the, 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 the flow of water being interrupted at this time by a, a blade shape, which, is, um, which I call a swan, because it's a kind of um, convenient uh, uh, participant in, in our history. Now, I don't mean to make comparisons here, <laughs> but, but 
A number of years later, Cordova and I were at, at, in the Metropolitan looking at the Leonardo da Vinci drawings from the Buckingham collection. And believe me, this had never been out. And I looked up to the upper uh, panel where there's a, there's a blade being interrupt, interrupting a flow of water. And I waited for Corda to say, great minds work alike. Uh, <laughs> but she didn't. Uh, and so let me go back just again. So th th this was the byproduct of the water pieces, uh, the falling water pieces. And uh, these are called Swan and its Wake, not Swan's Wake, because that would <laughs> be baby talk, so I had some problems with that. Uh, there are four or five feet. This is, uh, this is owned by a very good friend of mine who happens to be in this audience and will go unmentioned uh, because he's an anonymous uh, collector. <laughs> That's a marble version. This mound in the center is a, a nautilus shell uh, embedded in the clay because it has that wonderful triumphant look that uh, certain things do. And the rest of the thing was built around it and then it was carved in, in marble. <clears throat> That's called black swan. And this is called beach pebble, which is an, in fact, uh, if you go along the beach, you, see, you can see these pebbles with, a, with the uh, reaction of, of sand around them where they, the, as the water washes back, there's a collar above the, the pebble and then a, a wake which is, uh, remains to be analyzed and seen. Uh, I found a little too late for the other pieces, but, uh, and this is called uh, river grass. I tried a few, uh, a few fountains too. This actually, uh, water is pumped up through the through a uh, hole in the middle of this, and it spills over two surfaces, front and back. This thing is a few inches thick, and uh, and this is another version of it. Uh, this is another interlude, a, 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 a sort of a sort of a theme within a theme. I call this split almond, and it came about rather fortuitously, a friend of mine had come to the studio for lunch with his new wife. They had just married, and, uh, and traditionally in Italy, uh, the, the, the newlyweds get almonds as, as a gift. And we were cracking these things open after lunch and eating them, and, and found many of them in two halves. And I don't know whether this is a, 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 you know, a purposeful tradition, but the, the, the metaphor was irresistible in this, the, of these two things that combine make a whole. And one was usually more massive, not to be gender foolish here, but <laughs> I, I know letting myself in for something. Uh, the other one more delicate and feminine? <laughs> Anyhow, this was one of several. Uh, this was in, in, is in black Belgian marble. Uh, and it's, uh, they're about, uh, you know, four, 40 inches long, something of that sort. And this is called alternate uh, mounting. We have this parked at the county building at the moment. <laughs> when you go to pay your parking tickets, you can uh, <laughs> stroke it. <clears throat> this is a shot of Carrara. We, we, um, a number of sculptors in, in Rome discovered this great um, resource in, in, uh, in uh, Carrara and Pietro Santa, uh, wonderful carvers that were kept alive by doing statuary for gardens, quite you know, corny things, lots of copies, lots of funerary art. And uh, we went up there and, and began collaborating with these people, having them cut in, in marble things that we would do. And uh, this is a piece that's 11 and a half feet long and about eight high and weighed a whole lot getting cut out of the quarry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's at the Beverly Hills National, no, it's now Wells, Wells Fargo Bank Plaza in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, Sorry, that's the upside-down version. <laughs> uh, 
And this is uh, called the hollow of heaven, and it's, it's about six inches high. So the range of marble, the registry, can be very, very grand and be kind of useful in, in uh, almost any scale. <clears throat> and the idea of swan, the blade that started in this, in this water, uh, the swan in its wake piece began to have a life of its own, and there are a number of pieces that, uh, that came out of that. <clears throat> This is a, as, as sort of reduced as, as any work I've ever done. It's called Black Swan After Paros. And it's only as thin as a wafer. It tapers in a kind of wedge. And um, this, this line you see, they develop from, from uh, the idea of, of a couple of wings uh, sort of touching and, and, uh, and um, sort of interacting. There are two of those. Uh, Light, uh, this, these, these inner blades are slightly uh, raised, so they catch the light. Now there's th this, uh, this thing of working in cycles is, is, um, is something I can't seem to uh, kick. I come to the end of something and, and uh, 10 years goes by and then uh, it seems like a good idea to start again with, with new ideas. and, and and it's happened uh, three times with the goats and three times with the water pieces. And, and this was uh, uh, one of five pieces done in a week, actually, in a state that uh, used to be called divine inspiration and is now called a manic state, uh, or manic high. And, uh, coming, coming down from the country in, in uh, House in Italy, we, I told Court I wanted to do an another goat, maybe a life-size piece, and went to the studio that, that evening and um, uh, started this, which is called Bond Goat Sunday. And, uh, and it went very well. And I, f I finished it uh, Monday and started another piece, which is this. And uh, they seemed to take about a day. And it was one of those, I actually even played the violin on key that week. I remember that vividly. <laughs> It was, a, it was a sort of a divine uh, <clears throat> moment of being beyond oneself. Uh, that's uh, Wednesday. <laughs> and this is Thursday. <laughs> and it was great. I called a mold maker in and, and uh, had him cast in plaster, and it was, uh, they sort of, I think, hold up. Uh, we lived in Rome for 20 years, from 1954 to 74, really, with a few excursions back home. And uh, a town called Orvieto, which is one of the great jewels in, in Italy, one of them has arguably the most beautiful cathedral of all in its square, and is just, uh, has uh, great Etruscan sites and uh, Perfect thing. It, it, it is perched on a on a escarpment uh, above the Tiber Valley. It was originally a tr an Etruscan fortress, and uh, they had a, a program called Uno Scultura a, a Orvieto, and and uh, in which you were invited and would have your work out for six months in this uh, beautiful garden called the Fortress of Albornoz, and I had it uh, in 1976 and started. Uh, work again with a return to these big skulls and horns, feeling that maybe th this would be necessary to, to, to uh, deal with this uh, sort of extravagant uh, site we were confronted with. So after, the, after abandoning those 10 skulls in Ontario, I started with, with uh, uh, another one. They're named after months, roughly the, the fall of 1975. This is called uh, October and November, uh, December, and January, and we had we had the installation, uh, and uh, these are shots from the uh, the fortress itself, which is a wonderful 
these pieces were out for six months with, without a night guard, and there wasn't a single piece of graffiti or, or uh, vandalism in them, and they're quite fragile. Some of these things could be picked up with one hand and sort of moved out, but it was a wonderful uh, experience. This, this was originally um, um, an Etruscan amphitheater. That's one of the water pieces at the end of this battlement that looks over the city. That's permanently there. Bob Chirito saw um, a couple being photographed in their wedding uh, dress in front of that, and I thought that really was a compliment. Uh, <laughs> they're too young to know it was just a recent Johnny Come Lately sculpture. <laughs> you know, and I, I turn it. Oh, I guess uh, that's the end of those slides. Uh, I invited a friend up here, um, and he said, uh, he's an old friend, he knows me very well, he said, well, you're giving a talk, can I come and just have the hors d'oeuvres and, and go? <laughs> and I said, no, you have to sit through the lecture. And he said, it's kind of like the midnight mission. You have to sit through the sermon before you get the bowl of soup. And that's, that's what you're doing here. But, but if this gets too <laughs> long, this is another uh, view, that's Bhangot, uh, uh, October, uh, November. And finally somebody came uh, the last <laughs> week. <laughs> I always get some. <laughs> Anyhow, let me go back a little bit now. Uh, he, I, I mentioned that, that sculpture was often very boring. Well, it is more often very boring than not, because one, one um, unlike painting, which moves along rapidly with ideas and you can change and you know there's a whole structure within and a few flourishes, uh, sculpture is, is donkey work for the most part. Uh, you just you, you you have an idea and you work this thing and and then there are the mold processes and making it respectable. So you, you have fantasies, you know, you invent ways of entertaining yourself in these dreary ambience that sculptors live in. Uh, I usually either fall asleep or think about trout fishing, but occasionally artists usually in a kind of fear of survival think about great collectors and patrons, right? So you always imagine that somebody's going to knock on the door and it will be your own Mad Ludwig, and he'll, you know, give you this great <laughs> job to do. And I had a, I had a fantasy like this where the doorbell would ring. I would go to the door, and there would be this distinguished general, a general in there, look, looking sort of like Inzio Pinza. Do you remember him? <laughs> exactly. And he would say, "You are the sculptor Zajac, and uh, I have been searching far and wide." He says, "I have." This villa in Poggibonzi, named after me, his name is Giovanni di Poggibonzi, <laughs> and it waits for you. <laughs> and so you, you, you suddenly say, here is the, the divine chance I've been waiting all my life for. And I have always been waiting all my life for the, this, this, the, to, to do monuments to things hitherto thought unworthy of commemoration. Because we have plenty of courage, patriotism, pioneer motherhood, all of those things. We don't have monuments to, to timidity and uh, the morally handicapped <laughs> and, and uh, all of those things which are a big part of life. So anyhow, uh, I let my imagination run wild and I, and I did a series of, of etchings which have all of these, these things to the monuments to the timid to the clumsy. Uh, and uh, the end of the scenario is that you take all your sketches to the, the, the fortress or the villa Poggibonzi and you knock on the door. And, you, and the man comes to the door and he has a white jacket on. And you say, I am the sculptor that the Count has, has uh, you know, chosen to do all of his work. 
and the man in the white jacket says, oh dear, another one. <laughs> the count must have gotten out again. <laughs> so you're, you're stuck with all these great ideas and, and this wonderful sort of uh, uh, tragedy, uh, which, we know, which we know makes art go around. So I, I thought, I, well, I did these, these, uh, these suites. There are 49 embossments called The Pleasure Gardens of the Count Giovanni di Poggi Bonzi. I told the story once, and it was, it was reported in a journal as being a fact, which is kind of <laughs> interesting. Anyhow, here's the monument to the timid, to the clumsy, and to a cloud. And the other, there's, there are some that are a little, maybe risque, but I uh, will do without these. Uh, when we came to Santa Cruz in, in, uh, in 1974, uh, we came back. Uh, uh, we were here a year, and uh, I, I got a call about the possibility of a show at the Fordham Plaza at Lincoln Center. There's a great uh, barren space out there, and, and they have a sculpture show every, every couple of years. And there was this uh, wonderful forge, uh, the old foundry, the, as you come in the entrance of the university. And I got that um, place for a couple of months and, and uh, tried to build these skulls up again to a monumental scale. And they got very large this time. And three of them actually got cast into the temporary state of fiberglass and, uh, and sent back and joined uh, other earlier pieces. But these things, uh, this, this piece, goes about 11 feet high, and the horn that you see coming out of the side and looping over has, is a linear 23 feet, so they were, they were large scale. Um, and uh, we, I asked a, a friend of mine, a mold maker from, from Rome, called Romolo Felice, to come, uh, come and do the molds. And he flew over, and we had this wonderful month with him, and we had, uh, uh, five or six students working, and, and uh, Steve Rudzinski and, and Ed Gillum uh, sort of uh, supervising this. This is, this is Romolo, uh, just a day, the jet lag, uh, working on this mold. And you can see the, the pieces he's doing to make the, uh, the mold from which the fiberglass would be poured or painted. And, and that's, that's Romolo in the center, surrounded by his two uh, uh, assistants and uh, Steve and, and uh, Ed, and that's one of the horns. And we we got them and put them up in the meadow for a, um, a few days just to see them and photograph them. And that's called Big Skull and Horn Santa Cruz Forge, number one. That actually got cast into bronze and is owned by somebody in Southern California. Um, there's a sense of the scale and, and uh, sort of configuration of these pieces. Again, they're very hard to see in photographs. And that's the hideous, dreadful shot of the crane uh, groaning, picking up your pieces. Uh, I'm beginning to be like Pavlov's dog. I just hear one of these things and begin to quake and slaver. And, and, uh, and that's one of the installations. Uh, You could land a plane on this place. It was kind of a terrifying space. This prop on the horn was only in the fiberglass state, so it doesn't, uh, it isn't part of the permanent. This piece and, and the other one, the big circular piece, were also sort of decided against them and buried at the, at the local uh, landfill. I do a lot of business in those places. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in 1985, um, I started this last series of, of uh, water pieces, of which you'll see 12 examples, and enlarged them somewhat and, and left them freestanding with the marks of the, the um, sort of um, working on the top and bottom. And that shows the clay piece to the left. And they're, they're cast into, a, into plaster. 
the plaster is refined and another mold is, is um, made from that and it's cast into bronze. I had the good fortune of, of finding the Monterey Sculpture Center, in, in, which is now in Sand City, uh, in, its, in its infancy in a sense, um, and began to work casting there and we, they slowly accommodated my, my uh, grandiose <laughs> dreams by, by finding the means and technology to cast larger and larger sections of these pieces. They also provided uh, the kind of metal that is, is uh, quite flawless and very uh, necessary in a, in, a, in a work of such uh, high refinement. Um, so this was the, the beginning of the first of, of these um, pieces, which number uh, 21 now. These are the plaster states, and that's one of the molds to the right that we uh, work with. The, both these pieces are in the octagon in uh, I tried to write uh, a, a description of both the, the, the sort of intentions and the um, and also the uh, the problems in these things. Uh, as far as I know, they are uh, an original concept. Uh, the, the idea of fa falling water as a sculptural motif is is uh, I think has not been done, if, if, certainly not as in, an, in a sort of serious way. I think maybe decoratively it has in, in ornament. But uh, so this was, these pieces were extremely hard to kind of find one's way. There's nothing to look at. Uh, and they have to explain everything within what would be a kind of implied probability. Uh, they're not scientific. Uh, although they can't uh, sort of disobey these, the, the, the common sense of the way a column of water would fall, or one would think it would fall. And uh, that's the scale of the last one, and that's um, um, uh, one of the finishers of the foundry, Kyle, who is uh, one of the magicians, a, a, great, uh, a great finisher. That's the mold being sort of taken of this guy, and. Uh, and these are these little paintings that I've been doing uh, in between these. These sort of go maybe maybe make a kind of uh, symmetry to the earlier pictures. This is why I included them. They're very small, and they're shots of Westcliff, you know, usually from Westcliff. Uh, And these last things, uh, and I'm almost embarrassed to sort of show these things because it's, it, I can hear somebody saying, oh, geez, he's doing the elements, first water and now clouds. But uh, it's, it's irresistible, this idea of, of um, uh, um, to try and define what could be a cloud shape and put it on, on a mountain. So this is one of three, and they're the last three slides. And now the bowl of soup. <laughs> Before you have a chance to thank me, let me thank you for, for all coming and, and, uh, and uh, entrusting that you could uh, sort of uh, bear through this, <laughs> this uh, sort of bumpy ride you've had. Thank you. <laughs> Is the um, wow, this is loud. Is the octagon still open? 
Great. So we invite you all to go see Jack's work next door in the Octagon. And thank you very much, Jack, for sharing your work with us. Thank you.